Yo, 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 welcome to Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade, and it's the Thanksgiving week episode, so enjoy our gift to you as you celebrate the days off with some hot takes in anime, or is it an anime adjacent review, our sneaker pick of the week, and of course, our hard pass. All right, let's start with Nike's pre-order idea coming into clear view. Maybe. ComplexCon went down this past weekend and we'll have more to say about the convention itself on this week's Hard Pass, but first we need to talk about the public availability of the Nike Dunk Genesis, the much talked about sneaker collaboration both in digital and real life by Nike and Artifact. So a few weeks ago, we mentioned that we were able to purchase a pair of the Dunk Genesis for $222. We're not at liberty to say how we got it, I think, but just know that we did it without having to hold onto a digital collectible. The only hang up is that we have to wait until June of next year to get it in our hands. At the time, we cautiously praised Artifact and Nike for kind of introducing a slightly different way to do pre-orders in the Nike ecosystem. And since it worked for the true believers who bought into what Nike and Artifact are doing with their digital collectible hula baloo, it was only natural of us to speculate what this could look like if, say, everybody could jump in the pool and pre-order the Dunk Genesis or another big time Nike release and get them half a year later. Well, it turns out that we didn't have to wait that long because Nike and Artifact opened up the Dunk Genesis to everybody with $222. It started at ComplexCon, where people were able to pre-order up to two pairs of the Void and Ghost colorway of the Dunk Genesis, while the OG and X colorways remained exclusive. The following Monday, people online were able to do the same thing. No need to own a digital collectible, no prior knowledge of artifact or clones or the forging process required. You just needed to be around for the time to drop window and boom, pre-order secured. I already had my pair locked up a few weeks ago, but co-writer tried it and to his shock, it was easy. He actually didn't go through with pre-ordering a pair because he thinks the Dunk Genesis looks like the Dunks with 3D printed pieces that aren't even as cool as the acronym Nike Blazer Low Collab. However, he was pleased with the ease of pre-ordering sneakers from Nike. I mean, take a look at the clock on his screen capture. He was able to get the checkout at 9.17 a.m., an hour and 17 minutes after the window opened. Not a single hiccup or long wait in the process. If only sneakers did this, it would change everything. This is the way Nike made to order like it says so on the Artifact website. It's unclear why Nike removed the barrier to entry and kind of ensured that people who didn't care about Artifact in the first place will never jump on board now that they know that they can still get the shoes without having to mess around with a JPEG or a GIF over a year. But this could mean the start of a game-changing way Nike handles hyped releases. A few times a year, Nike could open up a pre-order window for a handful of upcoming releases, a Jordan Retro here, a, a Travis Scott collab there, a massive Nike SB Dunk, or just the next Vomero, and watch as people give them their money for something they won't be able to enjoy for at least six months. But where does this leave Artifact? It felt like everything we had read or seen about this move to the metaverse, hey, Hey, remember, remember we used to say that a lot, Metaverse? Anyway, uh, was that in order to be a part of this brave new future that for some reason also included old world physical sneakers, you had to know about NFTs, clones, and buy digital trinkets that would pay off in the long run. By opening up pre-orders to everybody, doesn't the walled garden analogy just kind of break down and there's no incentive to even care about whatever artifact is building? Like, if I was a sneakerhead who was interested in picking up a pair of the Dunk Genesis but didn't want to invest the time into playing whatever games or jumping through whatever hoops Artifact built, I'm ecstatic that I can buy them now. At this point, the only difference between people who bought in and those who didn't was access to two or more colorways and receiving them in June instead of August. I could see this being a problem if it was, let's say, the Air Jordan 3 and Artifact Believers were the only ones who could buy black cements and white cements while the rest of us only had mochas and pure monies to choose from. But the colorways that Artifact was offering? Eh, can't really say us regular people are missing out on that much. So let's just offer two viewpoints as to why Nike is doing this. Let's start with the cynical because of course we're doing that. The name of the show is Hard Pass, people. Anyways, Conspiracy Jacques and Conspiracy Co-Writer came up with this take. Nike saw the writing on the wall and this is their way of getting out of the game. Nike acquired Artifact as their big metaverse bet. Nearly two years later, it has been mostly forgotten by the general public because NFTs and metaverses are dead. I mean, 
Every once in a while, you'll see a story on The Verge or other tech sites about how companies and brands are abandoning their Web3 strategy while Nike is holding on and waving the flag with Artifact and their own dot swoosh platform, but that's about it. Part of that big bet was that sneakerheads, hype beasts, and gamers were going to be so pumped to join the ecosystem that it would eventually trickle down to regular people. Of course, that didn't happen because the last thing most people want is another thing to manage just to miss out on exclusive kicks. Anticipating huge demand for the Dunk Genesis, Nike made tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of them, not realizing the reason people like Dunks is for the utilitarian function, not because you can alter them to look like your default sneaker in Fortnite. Left with thousands of Dunk Genesises sitting in a warehouse somewhere that isn't Memphis, Nike calls an audible and makes them available to the public. The pre-order window, is really just a smokescreen to make us believe the shoes are still in the process of being made. Whatever dunks they don't sell will be in Nike outlets by the end of 2024. So if you think $222 is too much for dunks, wait until you can get them for half off at the outlets or reseller platforms. And we never hear about Artifact again. They'll be the latest to join the Nike graveyard, the place where all gimmicks go to die, like fuel bands, joy rides, Nike Plus sensors and the peach, damn it, Cobra. I'm not, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that. Anyway, okay, now to the positive spin, part two. If we're being generous here, this is all part of Nike's master plan to get people to embrace the digital something something. Yes, getting exclusive colorways and early access are cool and sensitive, but that's only if the sneakers are worth getting. So far, the only people who like the Dunk Genesis are people who love to say they love the Dunk Genesis. It sounds less like they're trying to convince me or you that the Dunk Genesis is great, and more like they're trying to convince themselves. Anyways, Genesis evangelists, which sounds more nefarious than it has any right to be, are not doing a great job of making people believe. Again, way more creepy than it should be. So what does Nike do? They do it themselves. The Dunk Genesis pre-order is a Trojan horse. It gets people in the door who otherwise might be skeptical. Sure, they'll have to wait several months for their dunks, but that's called conditioning. Once people are familiar with how it all works, that's when Nike swoops in and reveals their true intentions and actually sells people the shoes they want. Discouraged by the recent Air Jordan 1 Royal Reimagined? Well, what if Nike opened up a pre-order window for an Air Jordan 1 Royal in its OG leather construction? Sounds interesting, right? But there's a catch. If you were an early adopter into the Artifact Vision, you have a digital collectible that you can redeem to get the shoes next week like any other sneakers drop. If you pre-order the Dunk Genesis, you get exclusive access to the Royals and receive a pair in three months and a chance to be a part of the early adopter group next time. Everybody else, 2025, and entered into the same level as those who bought the Dunk Genesis with the opportunity to move up the pyramid. Huh, pyramid, huh. Something about that does sound bad though. Moving on, uh, James Whitner of the Whitaker Group has been named, but not charged as of this recording in an international money laundering investigation, according to a report by WSOC TV in Charlotte and court documents obtained by friend of the program, Sneaker Fetish. The Whitaker Group is the company that oversees retailers Ama Manier and Social Status, who you've no doubt heard about over the past two years, thanks to their high profile collaborations with Nike and Jordan brand. The investigation is saying that Whitaker received money from Chinese brokers through reselling products from an Oregon-based sneaker company that he had contracts with. In order to pay Whitaker, the brokers used money couriers who collected funds from illegal activities such as prostitution. The money would then be transferred to Whitner and introduced into the U.S. banking system. The Whitaker Group has released a statement saying that they have been cooperating with the investigation and that they have followed tax laws every step of the way. Those contracts Whitaker has with the unnamed Oregon-based sneaker company state that he cannot resell product to other retailers and third parties outside the country. Obviously, so many things can change between now and when this episode goes live. But regardless of what happens, this potentially shines Whitner and his businesses in a negative light that will be hard to come back from. Because even if Whitner and the Whitaker Group are able to wipe their hands of this investigation or the Oregon-based sneaker company is not who we all assume it is, they still committed the sneakerhead community's cardinal sin of backdooring. Ask Marcus Jordan if that's a reputation that's hard to shake. But unlike Marcus, Whitner cannot fall back on having the same last name as the brand that he frequently collaborated with on some of the most memorable retros in recent memory. Those projects could possibly be over. As for the sneakers themselves, the Ama Manier Jordans are the social status pennies and mag attacks. Yeah, 
nothing's gonna change. The investigation could take dramatic turns or end in banal legalese, and it's not going to stop people from asking if the Don Fives are gonna ship. If there's one thing I've learned in the past year, if a sneakerhead wants to wear sneakers designed by a figure who has fallen from grace, they will wear those sneakers without shame or self-awareness. I'm talking, of course, about Air Pippin. What did you think I was talking about? Anyway, moving on. All right, our pick of the week is the Nike 2023 Dornbecker Freestyle Collection. This is on December 2nd. Uh, big shout out to this year's participants in the Dornbecker Freestyle Program where young patients at Dornbecker Children's Hospital in Oregon are selected to design limited edition kicks. Since the first freestyle collection in 2004, the program has raised 30 seven million for Dornbecker. For the 19th edition, we've got a Nike Go Fly East designed by Christopher Muskies Jr., a Nike ACG Mountain Fly 2 Low created by Garrett Amerson, a Nike Air Max 186 by Haley Leva, an Air Jordan 3 by Hugo Juice Molina, a Nike Dunk High by Macy Bodley, and a Nike Cortez by Sydney Little. Okay, last week, Scott Pilgrim Takes Off debuted on Netflix, the anime adaptation of the Brian Lee O'Malley comic classic and cult movie and underrated video game places all of our favorites in their familiar setting, except when it doesn't. See, when I first saw the trailer for the show, I thought to myself, self, why would I watch a show that's going to tell the same story that co-writer and I have either read, watched, or played over a decade ago? Sure, there's going to be some cool new chiptune music from Anima Gucci, but I could just fire that up on Spotify. They've got to be doing something new, right? Well, they did do something new and we were pleasantly surprised. At first, it felt like they were speeding through the early beats of the story with a sense of urgency, which is to get to the scene at the nightclub where Scott was about to be potentially busted for kinda sorta dating Knives Chow and Ramona Flowers at the same time. But then the turn happens and it's, Without spoiling it, a very welcomed change. If this anime had just followed the same beats of the comic and movie and video game, I don't know that I would have finished the show. But with this refreshing new take on the story, I was hooked. Characters that felt one dimensional in other versions of the story get surprisingly deep roles and Scott and Ramona's relationship feels, yeah, no. It still feels like two people who really aren't great folks in the fantastical way that the internet likes to remember them, trying to figure out what exactly they are as kids moving into adulthood. It was, it was weird to me that anybody who saw the movie or read the comics thought to themselves that Scott and Ramona were this romantic ideal. Like, did we, did we watch the same thing? They both suck. And in an endearing way, because of course you're going to root for people in a world where the subspace and the American Super Mario Brothers 2 exist and Captain America, Captain Marvel, Superman, Fortune Cookie, April from Parks and Rec, and that guy who seems to be in every Wes Anderson movie are the supporting cast. But yeah, they still kind of suck. Totally deserve each other and hope they figure it out. Anyways, watch it if you want your expectations for a Scott Pilgrim story to be flipped, but don't watch it if you're an incel. All right, it's time for this week's Hard Pass. We take a look at something in the culture that just needs to go like ComplexCon. Wait, what? So this past week, just hear me out, ComplexCon emanated from the Long Beach Convention Center, a yearly staple of quote unquote, the culture since 2016. Complex Calm was a place to be if you wanted to step outside of your phone screen and see what it would look like if your Instagram discover page was brought to life. At least that's how it felt during the pre-pandemic years. From the small brands trying to break through and become the next supreme or undefeated to the big dogs like Nike and Adidas taking up large swaths of the convention space and holding activations with lines that stretched the entire floor, it was the place to be. The energy was special during those first couple of Complex Cons. You couldn't walk more than 30 seconds without seeing a celebrity who understood the environment they were in. A piece of artwork or merchandise that caught your eye until you saw the price tag or a line for exclusive sneakers that were going to be resold for five times the retail price the next day. Even running into someone you knew or meeting an online friend for the first time after talking on Twitter. Co-writer like in the first few years of ComplexCon? to what E3 used to be in the 2000s and early 2010s. Yes, it was commercialized and exploited as hell, but amongst the riffraff, not to mention the quote unquote rapper riffraff, there was a pure energy that you could feel. Like we, the collective we, were gathering for two days in Long Beach to do cool stuff. Oh, and don't forget about the weed. If you don't come out of the convention center smelling like a dispensary, you probably did Complex Con wrong. And speaking of doing Complex Con wrong, let's talk about my experience at this year's event. Co-Rider and I had tickets for both days. He showed up early and accidentally cut the wheel call line to get his wristband. Meanwhile, I showed up an hour later and also 
accidentally cut the will call line to get my wristband. All the while, there was a multi-hour general admission line that was amazing. Not because it smelled like weed, because whatever, that's what Complex Con is supposed to smell like, but because it made Co-Rider and I a little hyped. Not enough hype to get in that line, but hype that people were still turning out for the con. Like Complex Con 21 and 22 were different for obvious reasons, so 23 had this feeling, at least judging from the line, that it was going to be a return to form. Well, we were wrong about that. In past years, when I went down those steps to be greeted by the giant Complex Con sign, it was pandemonium. Just hashtag Spawn Con everywhere you looked. People were in line for something, shooting content, trying to hustle. It felt like everybody was there to level up for one reason or another. Creators creating, basically. Like, I'm not gonna say it was all positive energy. The big four loco booths certainly didn't help, but it was the Wild West, and it felt like anything could happen. This year, there was some of that energy, but there was also a feeling of fatigue. Like the faces I used to see before were gone. Brands I used to rock with had moved on or didn't feel the need to open up shop this year. And the lines were mostly for food. Not that there's anything wrong with that because man, I was hungry by the time we actually got through our first lap of the convention center, but I was also kind of done after that first lap. Hell, co-writer bounced because he said he had commitments later that day, but I just think he was bored. To be fair, he was bored every time I saw him at Compass Con when it was still popping. So I think that's just a him problem. But as soon as he told me he was out, he disappeared like Scott Pilgrim. Again, you guys gotta watch the show. That'll, that'll all make sense. Anyways, I stayed because I had to check out some of the panels and meet some friends upstairs, but I kind of felt the same way that Co-Rider did. Complex Con didn't do it for me this year. That's not to discount the fun and opportunities that first timers and vets may have had, but you can't tell me 2023 compares favorably to those pre-pandemic editions. So, are we actually saying a hard pass to Complex Con? No, not not really. Unlike E3, which deserved his ignominious death because nobody could figure out how to run that show in this era, Complex Con has plenty of potential to bounce back. In its first year, it rode the wave of social media, giving us a way to flex and to grow an audience. They tapped into that in a way that no other media company was doing, and along the way, they birthed new stars and curated the taste of an entire generation. In 2023, because life comes at you fast, Complex Con doesn't feel like the center of culture anymore. Some would argue they never were, but you don't get to fill a convention center the size that Long Beach has without doing something right. They just have to find that next big thing and no NFTs ain't it. Although that artifact Nike robot dog that was walking around the con, that was pretty funny. Whatever that is, whether it's sneakers, gears, or a new experience we're not even thinking about yet, Complex needs to capture it so Complex Con can get back to what it used to be. A place where I got to hang out with all of my friends from around the country and the world because we're all so busy with our stuff that we never get to chill. If Complex Con can't give them a reason to fly to Long Beach, then what are we doing this for? At least make it interesting enough for Co-Rider to last more than two hours next year. Oh, and you know, all the other stuff. Too. Thank you guys for watching Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade. Again, as always, we appreciate you watching the show. If you'd like to possibly be featured in a future episode, call us at 818-493-9325. Leave a short message, your socials if you want, no more than 30 seconds. All right, we'll see you next week. Peace.